Our Bible word is Romans 8 verse 26. Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses, for we do not know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. So this is the Apostle Paul. He's writing to the Romans. He plans to visit them in the future. He wasn't there before. And in Romans, Paul introduces himself and he also explains his understanding of the gospel. And in Romans, we find the most systematic exposition or, or explanation of the gospel by Paul. And also the reason why the gospel has come about and the life and ministry of Jesus. And so Paul, in the first eight chapters, he explains the background of Christianity, why it was necessary, uh, what, what was the background circumstances, what Jesus actually accomplished, and our present situation before he moves on to other topics. So if you look at chapters 1 verses 18 to 3 verses 20, that's where Paul addresses the fundamental problem. It is about God's righteousness versus mankind's righteousness. Mankind was trapped in sin, whether it be Jews or Gentiles. And Paul also comes to the conclusion that all are sinners. That's in chapter 3 verses 9 to 20. So what's the solution to this? And then Paul sets out it's God's saving righteousness by faith. It is by Jesus' faith and his faithfulness, etc., his obedience, whereby mankind has put, been justified or has been declared righteous. But there's also another problem. The believer has died to sin and the law, but sin and death and the negative impact of the law still plays a role. And that's what Paul discusses in chapter 6 to 7. But then he brings the solution in chapter 8, which is the role of the Spirit. And of course, that's our larger context also for our Bible word. It's chapter 8. And if we break chapter 8 down, there's the Spirit of life. That's in verses 1 to 11, where Paul discusses this battle between life in the flesh and life in the Spirit. Then there's a spirit of sonship he addresses in verses 12 to 17. It's the sons of God who are those led by the Spirit. And then he comes to the climax, the whole, to what is built up to in chapter 8. That's the Spirit is the first fruits. And that is verses 8 to, or 18 to 30. And this focuses on the future glory that will be revealed. So chapter 8 is all about the role of the Spirit, the life in the Spirit. It means that the body is dead to sin, etc. It's about being led by the Spirit. We are the sons of God. We are the inheritors, the co-heirs of Christ. And now also Paul speaks about the people who have received the first fruits of the Spirit and the future glory that, we, that will be revealed. And Paul spoke of the suffering also. If we're going to be glorified with Jesus, we must also suffer with Him. And, but Paul also says the present suffering can't compare with the future glory that will be revealed. And he also, very interestingly, he connects the redemption of human beings also with all of creation. It's not just human beings that are going to be liberated from sin and corruption. The whole cosmos is going to be liberated. If we go to verses 19... Paul says there, For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. So Paul is here personifying creation. Creation is waiting for God's people to be revealed. In other words, when they will receive the resurrection body, when they will be fully redeemed. And the creation, the cosmos is waiting for that. In verse 20, he says, For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. So, Paul is connecting here the liberation of human beings also with what happened with Adam and Eve and the fall. It's with the story of Genesis 1 to 3. Because when Adam and Eve fall, fell into sin, it also somehow brought creation also into a state of corruption. So because of mankind's sin and the fall, 
Creation itself was subjected to futility and meaninglessness, but it only so temporarily. Because if we go to verse 21, it says, Because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. So even creation, who is now in a state of corruption, will be redeemed, will be liberated. So this is goes back to the story of Adam. And both creation and humanity is in a state of corruption. But through the ministry of Jesus, they have been set free from the state of corruption. The process of being liberated from it has already begun. And that's true for both creation and also humanity. And Paul also is dependent here on what is known as his Adam Christology. Now Christology is a fancy word for the person and the work of Jesus, the identity of Jesus, what Jesus, who Jesus is and also what he has accomplished. And if we go back to Romans 5, specifically there verses 12 to 21, Paul contrasts the role of Adam and also the role of Jesus as the new Adam. And specifically, if we focus on verses 19, that's now chapter 5, verses 19. Paul says, For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners. Now that refers to Adam. So also by one man's obedience many will be made righteous. So Jesus, by his obedience, by his obedient death on the cross, etc., he undid the work of Adam. Adam introduced the world and the cosmos into a state of corruption. But Jesus, he fixed humanity. He redeemed humanity. So he's, he undid the work of Adam. Where Adam brought sin and death and corruption, Jesus completely overturned that and brought about freedom, redemption, and liberation from corruption. So remember this, if you read yet chapter 8 in these verses, hold in the back of your mind Genesis 1 to 3. The fall of Adam, the fall in, of creation into a state of corruption, and Jesus has overturned it. He's now initiated this new process of liberation and redemption for both humanity and also creation as a whole. Now if we go back to chapter 8, if we go to verses 21, Paul says there, because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. So in other words, creation's redemption, its restoration is dependent on the liberation of humanity and humanity receiving glory and freedom, etc. So as the cosmos, the fallen cosmos was home to fallen humanity, so the redeemed humanity with a resurrection body who has received the glory will live in a cosmos or a new creation that is also fitting to this new state of glory. So it's both humanity and creation will receive this glorification, this new state of being. Now Paul also speaks of what already exists and what awaits us in the future but also the present tension that we experience. So both humanity and creation is groaning, is longing for this new glory, waiting for this freedom from corruption, etc. Paul speaks there of creation's groaning, it's longing for this to happen. Then verse 23 says, not only that, but we also who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. So like creation is groaning for this glory, we also groan for this future glory. And it's this visible sign that we possess the Holy Spirit. And Paul says here, we have the first fruits of the Spirit. Now the image first fruits, it comes from the Feast of Pentecost or the Feast of Weeks, where people will bring their first fruit, so to speak, the first few Blades from the harvest, the wheat or grain, etc. It symbolizes more is to come. So it's, so it's the beginning of a larger process. 
Jesus was also the first fruits of the dead. In other words, his resurrection is only the beginning. More people will rise from the dead. Yeah, we have, Paul says we receive the first fruits of the Spirit. It's only the beginning. The bigger harvest is still coming when we will experience the Spirit, the life in the Spirit in full, completely. And this is the now, that the process that already exists. So we have the first fruits of the Spirit. And there is also the not yet that lies in the future. That is when we'll have the redemption of the body. That is when we'll have the spiritual body. And we can read of that in 1 Corinthians 15. So in between now, what we have as a first fruits, there's this tension. It's, we, scholars call it the eschatological tension. In other words, this tension about the end times. We're not there yet. Eschatology is the doctrine of the last things. It refers to the resurrection or the return of Jesus, the resurrection of the body, etc. And in this period of tension, there's this suffering and groaning. It's, this is longing for this future glory to be revealed. And now Paul also speaks of the role of the Holy Spirit in this interim period of tension, the spirit of longing, the spirit of groaning. We want to escape entirely from this corruption. We want to be, experience this liberation, this freedom from corruption. And now that's where Paul also speaks of the role of the Holy Spirit. And that's our Bible word. Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses. For we do not know what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. So, so the believer prays, but with in, in articulate prayer. With prayer that's just, you don't know what to pray because you're in a state of frustration or loss. And your spirit prays for this desperate help of God to intervene, to liberate. But that is where the Holy Spirit comes in. So even if they do not know what to pray, they frustrated and inarticulate prayers are at one at the same time the Spirit's prayer on their behalf. So our prayer, which is maybe incoherent because it's frustrated, it comes from a position of frustration, is at the same time the Holy Spirit's prayer. But the beautiful thing is, in verse 27, Paul makes clear, God understands it. Because God knows the Spirit. Because the Spirit prays, the Holy Spirit prays with our spirit. So even if our prayer is inarticulate and maybe a form of mumbling or whatever, the Spirit prays and intervenes on our behalf. And the Spirit is, says, come, redeem us. And God understands this prayer that is offered by the Holy Spirit on our behalf. And this all contributes to the good. That in the end, everything will be well. And then, finally in verses 29 to 30, Paul reassures everyone, God has initiated this process, and God has already given redemption, etc. And it will happen. Because God has foreknew this, He foreordained this. This is a certainty of our salvation. This is a certainty that we will receive this future glory, this redemption of our body. So, Paul interconnects our story here with the story of creation. Both creation and humanity will be liberated, will be glorified. As human beings, we will receive the redemption of our bodies, future glory. But in this interim period, where we are groaning and longing for this future salvation, Sometimes not knowing what to pray. That's where the Holy Spirit intervenes and prays with us. Our frustrated prayer is one at the same time the Holy Spirit's prayer to God. And He intercedes on our behalf. 